Hello everyone, welcome to this week's EKG. We have a good case for you this week. It's an 18 year old who has just overdosed on Flexeril within the last hour. He had this prescription for low back pain and now he says he feels like he can't move his arms and his chest is hurting. You get this set of vitals. It looks like his heart rate is 70. Blood pressure is 96 over 60, so a little soft. Satting 93 on room air. Sugar looks okay, and his temp is 101, so a little febrile. He is having chest pain, but aside from that, even if he wasn't, we always want to get a 12 lead on any overdose, and hopefully after this uh, lecture, you'll understand why. But here's what you get, and this is a very interesting one. I'll give you a second to take a look at it, see what you think, and then we'll go through it together. Okay, just like always, even though this looks different, we're gonna start the same way every time. So let's start with our rate. The computer's telling me that we have a rate of 73. I'm gonna see if I confirm with that. Um, I try to find a QRS that matches up with a thick red line. So we'll have this one here, and then we count down 300, 150, 100, 75, 60. So somewhere between 60 and 75. 73, I agree with the computer. We have a rate of 73. Next, we move on to our rhythm. We ask two questions here every time. Is there a P wave before every QRS? Can we call this a sinus rhythm? And then is it regular? I'm going to start with regularity on this one because it's a little bit easier. To the naked eye, I see that it marches out. It looks like there's a pretty regular QRS complex. Um, I will call that a regular rhythm. But in terms of sinus rhythm, where we look for P waves, I tend to look in lead two. And sometimes you can see them in V1, but if you look here in V1 and we march out these P waves across the precordium, it's getting a little bit hard to tell here. Are those two P waves? Is this looking a little like fib? Um, is this a P wave here? But then all of a sudden across the precordium, I don't see any P waves here and it's looking maybe a little more idioventricular. And so I do see some P waves in lead two, which makes me feel okay, but I don't see them all the way across the 12 leads. So is this sinus or not? I don't know. I would call this a little more idioventricular because um, a reason we'll get to in a minute. But next we move on to our axis. And so this is where we look at leads one and leads AVF. You ask yourself, where is the majority of this QRS vector pointing in lead one? It's mostly up. Our left thumb is up. In AVF, a little hard to tell. I'll go with this one because it's a little more clear. This one is up as well. If you're ever not sure, this one looks like it may be a little isoelectric. Sometimes you can use lead two as a tiebreaker. I'm going to go ahead and call this a normal axis. We have two thumbs up. Next is our intervals, and this is where it gets really interesting. QRS is long at 126. Remember, anything greater than 120 is prolonged, and then we look at our QTC, and we're at 490 here. Remember, 450 is prolonged for an adult, but once we get to 500, that rhythm is at risk for spontaneous arrhythmias. And so we do have a wide QRS here, and we have a prolonged QT. And this is in the setting of an idioventricular, a possible idioventricular rhythm like we mentioned before. And so that would make sense that you have a long QRS if that beat is originating from a little bit lower than the sinoatrial node. So I do think those kind of confirm each other. And then as we move on and we finally look at our ST segments, I start with 2-3 AVF usually as I read from left to right. I think you can argue that there's a little bit of ST depression in these inferior leads. As we move to the lateral leads, um, same kind of thing, a little bit of ST depression here. Um, and then across the precordium, we have inverted T waves, we have um, some ST depression, just kind of diffusely. They don't look right. Um, I wouldn't call this a STEMI. I don't see any really ST elevation, but this is a concerning 12 lead in the setting of an overdose. So as we think about this very concerning 12 lead and what it might be telling us in the setting of an overdose, the thing we need to be most concerned about is a TCA overdose. And TCAs get their name from tricyclics, and that comes from their chemical structure. You can see you have three rings here, tricyclics, three rings. And typically this used to be just antidepressants. But now, as people have learned that these antidepressants are dangerous to overdose on, they're not prescribed as much anymore. But the thing that does have this three-ring 
kind of chemical structure that can cause sodium channel toxicity is flexoril. And this is very commonly prescribed for back pain. As people are trying to move away from narcotics for back pain, flexoril is becoming more common. And you need to know that it falls into the category of a tricyclic. And what's wrong with these is you can get an anticholinergic toxidrome from them. This guy had a fever. He was a little bit dry. He had a little bit of myoclonus with trouble moving his arms. But those aren't the things that are going to kill you. They're the things that you'll see and your patient may complain about. But the things that are dangerous are right here, the cardiac toxicity, sodium channel toxicity. And a QRS that's wide can tell you you need to watch out for seizures or possibly arrhythmias. And if we look at the classic teaching for TCAs, what you're going to see, the big diagnostic thing, is actually in lead AVR. You're going to see positive R waves that are bigger than the S waves in lead AVR by a ratio of 0.7. Sometimes, and then everything else gets long. You'll have a wide QRS. You can have a long QT. And if you have the wide QRS, you need to worry about seizures. But you can also get idioventricular rhythms. A lot of times, these start out tachycardic as well with the muscarinic involvement. Um, but this is a classic, a pretty classic look, and your, your thing that you're going to be able to see the easiest really is those R waves in lead AVR. Now our patient didn't exactly read the textbook because these aren't the classic R waves that you see in a TCA toxicity, but they are high and they are prominent. And we also have the prolonged QRS, the long QT, the idioventricular rhythm. This is absolutely in the setting of a flexural overdose, so I'd absolutely treat this as a TCA toxicity. And our treatment for this is going to be sodium bicarb. The sodium in the bicarb actually helps overcome the sodium channel toxicity. It's going to help you narrow that QRS and um, decrease the, the likelihood of having to treat a seizure. If your patient does seize, uh, it's not your fault. Just realize that can happen. Treat those like you would with any benzo that you have available. And if they do go into torsades because of that long QT, you can give your magnesium and treat that appropriately. Just remember your biggest treatment here for a TCA overdose is going to be sodium bicarb. And that is all we have for today. Thank you for your attention, and I'll see you next week.